So I, 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 was, I was just talking uh, with Eric, and, and I, I just met him today, but I'm kind of wondering if he hates me. I mean, he, he has me go after Tina, who has the absolute you know, best growth um, in the history of ACT, and before lunch. So I am sandwiched into the best half hour of your day. So I, uh, I, I certainly hope that you find this uh, to be a rewarding time. Uh, I certainly am, am humbled and privileged to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Dave Taylor. I'm the uh, principal of the Dayton Early College Academy. Uh, we are an, an urban charter high school, uh, and obviously located in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, first and foremost, we are an early college academy. We were uh, the first of, uh, of the early colleges in Ohio, and I believe the 13th in the nation. Uh, if you're unfamiliar uh, with early college and what that model resembles, essentially uh, it, it, it goes back to taking students uh, in high school and giving them an opportunity to, to actually take college classes and establish an expectation as the, for the entire school that all students will earn up to an, up to an, uh, an associate's degree and obviously anywhere in between. Uh, and so our school was created with that, with that mentality. If you take students who uh, may not necessarily have shown uh, themselves to be the most academically gifted, but have shown uh, some potential and some interest in college, and then essentially uh, place them into an, an academically rich environment uh, and, and uh, support them and see what happens. And so we've been, we've been blessed uh, to work with Dayton Public Schools. We were in, initially created back in 2003 as Dayton Public High School. Uh, so, when it, so when it first began, we were all Dayton Public High, high School or Dayton Public employees. Uh, and several years into it, uh, and I'm not sure how things are funded in, in your states, but Day, uh, Ohio has a horrible, horrible funding model. Uh, and so uh, things are funded based on property taxes. Uh, in order to raise uh, additional funds, uh, they had to uh, seek a levy. Uh, that levy did not pass, and one of the threats that Dayton had made was that because we were successful, they would uh, significantly re, uh, reduce or cut our program. And so uh, once the levy uh, didn't pass, we began to feel very nervous. Uh, and so we actually uh, uh, brokered a deal with, with the district where we become a charter school sponsored by the district. This works out quite well for us because it gives us quite a bit of academic freedom, uh, and we've, we've uh, flourished uh, in the process since. We were initially a 9 through 12 high school, uh, as most are. Uh, and in studying uh, successful schools that, that are doing what we're doing across the country, we realized that beginning in the ninth grade in many ways is far too late. Our students came in in many cases, and I'm sure uh, several of you high school principals can speak to this, uh, and, and in many cases, three, four, five, even six grade levels behind where they were supposed to be. And so uh, for us to be uh, professing to give them an, an early college education, to be sending them off to uh, college actually prepared for success, uh, it, it was, uh, a bit, of a, a bit of a deception on our part. And so we realized that if we were going to do this truly well, we would need to move back to the seventh grade to establish some of the patterns and uh, habits that are needed in order for students to be successful. Uh, as any other charter school, we, we are not selective uh, in, in our admission. It's, an, it's a first come, first serve process. And so uh, we spend a good deal of time talking with parents about what kind of child comes to the school. Uh, what kind of child should seek to come here so that they aren't surprised when they come and realize that this is a bit more rigid and a bit more rigorous than some of the uh, other environments they may have been a part of. Uh, I won't go through all of our demographics. You see them up on the screen. We are an urban school. Uh, the vast majority of our students will be the first in their family to go to college. Uh, we are about 80 percent, 81 percent, I think is the exact number, African American. Uh, we do have a growing number of Hispanic uh, and Middle Eastern students as well. Um, and so uh, for us, uh, you know, we deal with a, with a population that is, uh, is ambitious um, but may not have had uh, in the past the, the best education, and we, have, we view it as our responsibility to get them to where they uh, profess to want to go, which is college. So to, to frame the conversation, you know, T Tina in the last uh, presentation talked about, you know, uh, uh, how do you go from being a, a, a mediocre, underperforming school to being an absolutely great one. Well, we had a different problem. Uh, we were a, a good school. Uh, you know, right here, you know, every school in Ohio takes the Ohio graduation test. If you looked in our district, uh, this test, it's a, it's a sophomore level test that you take. Um, and if you pass it, you move on. If you don't, you keep taking it. Uh, and, and it really, as I'm sure you know in all of your states, it's a minimum proficiency test. And you can see our results are in red. Very, very good results. And so we uh, got a lot of publicity, uh, both locally uh, and uh, at state, the state level and, of course, nationally as well. We became uh, really highly regarded for what we were doing there. Um, but the honest truth was we were a good school. We were not a great school. Um, so the natural question for us was, was to ask, you know, is there, is there a problem? And if so, what is the problem? Uh, and so 
if our, if our OGT scores are good, and, and especially compared to, to our counterparts in the district, do we need to be doing anything differently? Uh, we're a pretty transparent place. We'd like to just put everything out there so you can see it, warts and all. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, unlike Tina and, and like some of the others, we are simply not where we need to be. Uh, we have quite a long way to go, and we're not afraid to admit that. Uh, but we think that we've done some pretty special things, and we want to share those with you. Uh, I, I don't come to you today as an expert. I don't come to you today as somebody who has solved this problem. Um, we've done a lot by trial and error, as I know others here have. Uh, and we're proud of some of the things that have come out of it. And we've, we're hiding some of the things that we did that didn't work, and we're moving on. So one of the really nasty things about our school, this, is the, the, this right here is our composite ACT scores from 2007, 2008. Uh, you know, a 19.1. Now, that may not look very impressive if you're from a suburban district, but the honest truth is, if you compare that to where our students were coming from, it's actually a pretty good number. Uh, uh, the, you know, the rumors go around, and I've actually confirmed this, uh, one of our local high-performing high uh, schools in, in the city had a, uh, had, a, had a valedictorian whose ACT score was an 18. Um, and so that being the expectation, when that child goes to school, they're, they're in for a rude awakening. It, 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 is that right? Oh, man, you guys are dead out there. Wow. Uh, okay, so, okay, so if a child isn't 18 as a valedictorian, there's a disconnect. Am, am, am I right? Okay. Uh, and so for us, we realize that even if our average graduate is doing better than that, quite simply, they're still going to be in for a rude awakening when they leave our school and head into college. And so we have quite a bit of work to do. We, we have to move away from this notion of the OGT being our end mark to really uh, looking at the fact that really it's that ACT that is, uh, is, is our main goal. So I, I point this out to you here. I'm, I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on our data, but I want to point this to you to understand the fact that uh, we've seen some growth. Uh, and we've seen some, some sustained growth. And uh, you'll notice there's obviously a big jump in the year uh, 2009. And, and you may wonder, okay, that may have just been happenstance. Obviously, we've seen growth sustained after that, but I think we can go back and point to some very specific things that we did that year uh, that actually began that, that process for us. And we're very proud of some of the changes that we made there. And so uh, I, actually some of my colleagues that went before me uh, have enumerated some of the things that I'm going to speak about. But I think it's important to see the, the consistency and the continuity in some of the strategies that are being implemented in all of our schools. Um, so the natural question and, and the thing that we've asked, we've been asked by others is, okay, so you, you, you saw some tremendous growth in your ACT scores. Uh, what did you do? Fair enough. Uh, as others have talked about, you know, there, there's a paradigm shift, that there's a change in mindset. Uh, we went from being a, a school that, you know, hey, OGT scores look good. Our curriculum is built around getting kids to that OGT in the last couple of years. We focus on, on just college credits. Uh, but we, we realized that mastering that sophomore level test quite frankly, isn't getting it. Uh, how many of you in your schools are there? Again, dead crowd. How many of you in your school, can, can, can I see a show of hands? Or is, is the understanding there that, 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 the, that the basic level test, okay, let's, let's ask a better question. How many of your teachers think that that test is the metric? Okay. Uh, which, of course, means that you've got some work to do. Uh, and for us, it came down to having really several faculty meetings where we had heart-to-hearts around who are we truly as a school? And that's a really interesting question to ask because you have your, your mission statement, you have your core values, but sometimes there's a disconnect between what those words say and what we in our classrooms actually think. So our conversation had to go back to, okay, if we're, our core values are saying that we're all about college, we're all about future success for our students, is that truly a metric that measures what we need for our students? And even though we argued and debated about it and we were very proud of what we had done, we realized quite simply it was no. If we want our kids to be successful in college, then we have to get to the point where they can take the ACT, be successful on it, and go and not end up in, in remedial courses in their first uh, year or two in school. So we realized very quickly that sophomore level test was not an accurate measure of success there. Uh, we also realized, and again, maybe for, for, your, for your staff and your faculty, this was a very obvious thing, but for us it was not, uh, that ACT scores simply do not happen in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is, ACT will tell you, if you want your child to score at a 20, they need to do this. If they need to score at a 21, they need to do this. Now, quite frankly, that was news to us. We had focused so intently and built our curriculum so structured around this Ohio graduation test that breaking away from that and actually looking at the ACT and understanding the fact that, you know what, it is a bit different than what we had expected, what we had thought, and we have to then adjust what we're doing 
to actually get there. And so our assessments, the way that we measure what students know and what they're learning, must tie in directly to those ACT expectations. And so that's a, that's a big task, it's a very daunting task, and we didn't know how to go about doing that. So I'll explain to you in a bit how we figured that process out. Um, there is also the idea that if I'm a freshman level or a, so or a sophomore level teacher, then my primary focus is the OGT, let everybody else after that. The, you know, junior year you focus on it, senior year you focus on it. Again, is, is, is that a concern in a number of your schools? Is, is it the, the job of the upper level teachers to take care of the ACT? Can I get a nonverbal or anything, please? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, we realized that Obviously, we profess to be a college prep school. You know, that, that was, that's a big thing for us. Um, but we simply weren't exposing our kids to the, the, the rigor that they needed at an early enough stage. Um, and, and, you know, ACT will tell you one of the single greatest determiners of, of success in college is have they been exposed to the actual rigor in high school that they need to. Uh, and so we realized the fact that uh, not just you know, putting them in those more difficult classes, having every kid take physics, um, as you're seeing at, uh, at, at other schools, those kinds of things are important if our students are gonna have the exposure and they need to be successful at the next level. So, uh, over the course of several years, um, sp starting specifically back in, in uh, the 2008-2009 school year, uh, we began to implement several high leverage strategies that we view uh, as really the, the the, the, the major rationale or, or the major uh, impetus behind our improvement over the course of these last several years. Uh, and so I want to walk through those uh, with you here and spend a little bit of time on each. Uh, first of all, uh, we were, uh, were, were granted the opportunity to work with an organization called Battelle for Kids. Uh, Battelle for Kids primarily work in Ohio and Tennessee, uh, but essentially what, what the idea behind their project was, was to have uh, a select number of schools in the state uh, begin to administer quality core assessments. Great, sure, love it. Uh, but the next step behind that was that they were going to use these quality core assessments not just to um, measure uh, 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 achievement, but also to measure growth. And not just growth within students, but also provide value-added data within, within teachers and students. And so for us, we were able to see not only uh, is our curriculum aligned, but are our teachers, is what they're doing uh, instructionally, is it actually providing real uh, value to our students? And I'll be honest with you, uh, the results are very eye-opening. People who you thought were your absolute best teachers, you sit in there, they're doing, absolute, they're doing wonderful things instructionally, uh, their test results come back and they're not doing the right things. And it's frequently because they have not aligned their curriculum to the quality core. And so for us, we realized that we needed to stop uh, doing a lot of things that we were doing, throw them out the window, and begin to adopt the quality core curriculum, uh, and also to invest in learning how to uh, do formative instructional practices. I'll talk about that quite a bit later. Um, we also uh, have invested in something called the Common Instructional Framework. This is uh, somewhat unique to our school. There are only a few schools across the country that use this, but I'll speak about it in a little bit. Um, and then within that, instructional coaching and peer coaching are, are absolutely pivotal portions of that. Uh, and then uh, this next thing I want to talk about is something that we uh, made up several years ago and have used, and it's, a, it's, it's kind of a pivotal portion of our school, and that's our gateway process. So let's go ahead and get into those. Um, you know, with the quality core, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where uh, we, we kind of always thought that uh, ACT, as I mentioned to you before, ACT scores just kind of happen. If you were a smart kid, you'd do well. If you weren't a smart kid, maybe you'd struggle on it. Uh, but obviously, we realized that uh, the quality core provides a way for English 9 classes to, uh, to actually provide support for English 10 classes. And there's actually a roadmap for what should we be targeting in each grade, how should the curriculum be, be aligned, and then from there developing it. So for us, we spent quite a bit of time. Uh, we, uh, we printed off uh, all the course requirements. Uh, they gave us big posters, and we had content meetings where we just laid everything out, and we began to circle things, and we, and we asked ourselves, where does this fit? How, where, are we, where are we doing that? And it was nothing other than figuring out how this becomes the foundation as opposed to the OGT becoming the foundation. And so we, dev we found sample units, we found sample assessments, and we made those the bedrock of who we are and what we do. We also uh, realized that uh, a lot of the texts that we had chosen quite simply weren't rigorous enough, quite simply uh, weren't going to push students to the levels of success that we needed them to go. So we threw them out the window and we went in a new direction. 
Uh, and we've always been anti-teaching to the test. You know, we've always prided ourselves, especially with the OGT, to you know avoiding uh, you know teaching to uh, that that a minimum standard test. But we realize that with the ACT, it's quite a bit different. Uh, what we want to do is in different grade levels, we teach to a score, and so we're going to know uh, in in uh, in certain grades you're gonna you're gonna aim for for a 20. Okay, so the 20 level skills is what I'm responsible for as a ninth grade teacher. I'm going to be teaching those things, but when they leave and go on the next grade, they need to know that stuff. And so uh, for us, uh, it was a very liberating feeling to feel like there's a very clear map uh, on how to get there, and also uh, there's resources to help make that happen. It also allowed for quite a bit of differentiation within uh, what we did and, and how we did it. And so we realized that uh, if you're in a sophomore level class, uh, then, then you, you, know, you have the flexibility to allow students who are working towards a 24, you know how to stretch those kids now. You know how to uh, give them a target to shoot for. Uh, as, as you saw before, I'm a smaller school. Uh, you know, we have about 425 students, uh, and you know, and that's seven through 12. And so I only have one teacher at each grade level. So it's difficult to necessarily uh, uh, track by by ability when when because the schedule doesn't uh, doesn't typically allow for that. Uh, but we are able to differentiate quite a bit more and be much more intentional about how we do that uh, as we teach to a score. Uh, this next thing I want to talk about is something that Patel did uh, with us, Patel for Kids, once again. Uh, they actually invested money in each of our schools to help us uh, learn how to use formative instructional practices. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with this term, formative instructional practices? Okay, great. Most of you are. And, you know, um, this is kind of the next step. Uh, if you're looking at formative assessment, that's obviously a very, very popular thing now. Uh, but, but the... The, the criteria for us, the reason why, why we moved toward this is because if we're going to look at what we're doing on a regular basis, our everyday assessments, the, the things that we're doing on a regular basis need to be uh, pointing us in the direction of ACT and, and of course that quality core. And we need to be providing descriptive feedback on a regular basis for our students as opposed to uh, waiting for a quiz or for a test to actually let students know where they are. And we need to be using this to actually go back and address it. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've got a, I've got a talented staff. Um, I, I love my faculty, love my teachers, think they do a phenomenal job. But one of the issues that we had was that even though they were doing things around uh, uh, formal instructional practices, we weren't using common language and we weren't, we weren't being consistent in our application of, of each of these types of things. So having uh, professional development around this actually helped us uh, not only use these things, it also helped us come up with a common language about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So uh, the staff training, you, you, know, you may, wonder, want, may wonder how did we do that? Well, quite frankly, uh, we, we, we used the train the trader uh, model. We sent several people to Battelle for kids. They came back and then in small groups actually trained our faculty. Uh, we find that at our school, our staff only listens to our staff. Uh, and I'm not sure if you have the same issue there, bringing in some, someone from the outside. People tend to tune them out and think what you're saying doesn't apply to us. But when one of our people goes somewhere and comes back and says, this will work here, then their ears perk up and they listen. And so that, is, uh, that, that typically is our model. Uh, we have people who are open-minded go, and they come back and they share, and then that way we actually get things done. Uh, we, we, uh, we had whole faculty meetings where formal instructional practices, that was a discussion. And we made sure that we all kind of understood this is why we're doing this, this is where we're going, and we worked to ensure that people bought in. Uh, and then the last thing, of course, that we did, uh, there's online modules that have been developed that I believe Patel for Kids is rolling out uh, even beyond Ohio in, in the near future. Uh, the next thing that we've done is something that's, that's, uh, that's being pushed uh, by Battelle and also for other institutions like Achievement First, uh, and that's quarterly interim assessments. And, and what I mean by that um, is, is essentially uh, a, a, a test every nine weeks uh, that's really uh, summative in some ways and formative in others. Essentially, it's developed in a way that you, you, you take questions off the qu uh, Quality Core test builder uh, and you use those questions to uh, check where you are quarterly and actually assess, okay, do students know the things that have been, they've been taught for this quarter? And while that may seem like a very obvious thing to do, far too often in our business, we wait until the end of the year to see what the score is. Uh, these interim assessments allow us to far earlier in the year step back and look at it and say, okay, after one quarter, the material that I taught, how much of it actually sunk in? And not with the verbiage that I use on a daily basis, with quality core questions, with, with uh, questions out of their test bank, what do our students know it, and am I doing a good enough job teaching it? And, uh, and if not, then I've got to go back and obviously adjust what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Uh, and so from there, we, we perform our quarterly diagnostic. Uh, we want to look at a couple of things. Uh, frequently, um, as, 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 uh, as was said earlier by John, um, 
you know, a lot of times our, our, our students will, will, uh, will know the material inside and out, they'll take the test, and they'll miss the question completely. And we have to go through and look item by item to figure out why did that happen. And oftentimes it is, it's a vocabulary issue. We've used an interchangeable word, and we simply didn't expose them there. Well, on the ACT, again, they're not going to have a proctor they can ask those questions to. So we have to make sure that we understand the fact that we have to use the right vocabulary. Uh, and we also then, of course, have to make sure that we go back and we adjust our instructional practices. And we also have to make sure let's get that, up here, um, that we intervene when necessary. Um, I, you know, I, John also mentioned uh, they, uh, uh, they talk about attacking the gap classes. We call them just-in-time uh, short courses. Essentially what we do when we see students who aren't getting it, we find uh, someone who can actually pull them aside, sit down, and, and lead a small group. It may, it may be three or four days, it may be an after-school thing, but essentially when we identify a significant need and, it, and it's not a class-wide thing, then we have to pull students and we have to address those skills immediately. Um, Obviously, you've heard other things that I won't go over all these because others have talked about them, but the bottom line is we don't wait until the end of the year to make these adjustments. These adjustments are made quarterly, they're made regularly, and they're made uh, efficiently. So we can know uh, very quickly, is a student on track? If not, what, what should we do? And we have a plethora of options available. And these assessments, these quarterly interim assessments are done uh, cumulatively. So we'll know there are certain things that, uh, that we have to go back to over and over. These skills uh, loop, and so if we aren't regularly assessing them, then it's just like anything else. If you don't use it, you lose it. So for us, we have to make sure that our students do actually uh, know this material and that uh, they see it each quarter. Uh, Within the curriculum alignment still, uh, we had to make sure that we had very clear co data conversations um, in a number of ways, uh, both uh, within their uh, cohort uh, teams, uh, with me as their administrator, and then also with students. And so these conversations uh, revolve around those, those quarterly interim assessments, around their quality core assessment results, and essentially come back to wh what is the goal uh, for, for the students, where is your goal, you know, what, what ACT score are you hoping to attain, and then from there, what practical steps are we taking? Are we doing the right things to get you there? And then from the teacher's level, okay, if we're looking at not, not only your value-added data, but also your achievement data, what do we need to be doing differently, what's working well, what can you share with everyone else that, that, that's successful, and then how can we support you to make sure that your practices improve as well. Um, and then every once in a while, uh, I, I, we do this about once a year, uh, we, we, we have kind of a reorientation or, um, or, or a renorming session where essentially we sit down collectively and we'll look at, okay, let's pass out. Um, this is a ninth grade paper, okay? Um, what's the student's te thesis? Is this a strong thesis or not? Let's grade it on our common rubric and let's see what we come up with. And we need to make sure that we're doing the same thing from grade nine all the way, grade, all the way through grade 12 so that our expectations uh, don't jump when students go from grade to grade. Um, we also uh, made the, the, uh, the, the major decision to move to Algebra One quite a bit earlier. Um, you know, we, we you took students in uh, primarily uh, in the ninth grade uh, in the past, and when they came in, they came in with significantly deficient algebra skills. Um, and they, they would come in grade levels behind, and so we actually would do ninth grade pre-algebra. Uh, and you can see our scores here in terms of uh, college readiness. Uh, you can see we, we had about 10% and then about 18, uh, 19% of our students uh, at, at the college readiness uh, score. Um, and this is back in 2007, 2008. And then once we actually began to push students into algebra earlier, we required all students in ninth grade, and we have a select few students who weren't ready for it. Uh, but when we actually began to push students into algebra one earlier, you can see that we've actually seen significant growth. So we actually, uh, this past year, hit almost 40% of our students reaching that college uh, readiness benchmark. And essentially, the, the, the lesson that we've learned is that uh, you, know, you simply can't stop and always remediate. Sometimes you have to go along and remediate as you're going. And what we had done, and, and uh, it was we spent that ninth grade year and simply in, in remediation mode. We want to go back over the things that you should have been learning and you didn't learn uh, in, in that one year. But instead, what we have to do now is we have to uh, start you in Algebra 1, and we have to go back and we have to uh, address those things outside the school day, before the school day, uh, with a tutor. <clears throat> to ensure that you have uh, what you need. And you'll see that this upcoming school year, we've actually uh, revamped our curriculum a little bit again to ensure that our eighth graders are taking Algebra One. And as we speak, we have a group of students who 
are in, in summer school uh, getting ready for Algebra 1 because they've shown that they're still struggling there in seventh grade uh, with, with, with the pre-algebra uh, uh, materials that we had available to them. But our goal was to have every single one of our students ready and, and, uh, and available to take calculus, whether it's business calc or, uh, or, 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 or regular calc, uh, when they reach their senior year uh, in high school. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is the common instructional framework. Uh, you know, the, the ACT really and the Quality co uh, Core provided in many ways the framework and the structure for us to look at how we go about doing things. Um, but it didn't necessarily address um, the, the actual instructional practices that you use on a daily basis. And so uh, while I believe I've got a very talented faculty, what, what we find is that people are off doing their own thing and don't always have things on the same page here. So essentially what this common instructional framework is and what it does is it provides common language for, uh, for teachers and it, it provides six high utility strategies that really teachers love, teachers use, um, and teachers find uh, work with the kids. Um, and you can see them up there. Uh, essentially the, the idea is these are strategies to help get at rigor much more quickly. Um, if you spend time teaching students uh, via lecture, we, we all know how, how that goes. This right now, what I'm doing with you is far less effective, as far less effective than if we were to do something more interactive, and, and that's why we're doing those things later on in the, uh, uh, in, in the institute. Uh, but these strategies are all designed to help students develop critical thinking skills, uh, to develop uh, their collaborative teamwork skills, and to ensure that, that when they write, they're writing much more effectively uh, because they're not worried about Am I going to be graded on this necessarily? It's more geared towards I'm actually using my writing skills to actually learn. Uh, and so uh, we've actually had several people from our faculty uh, go receive training on what the Common Instructional Framework is, and then we spent years uh, training our faculty on how to use this, and we're constantly reorienting everyone on, okay, so we've, we've seen it, we've used it, let's go back over and make sure that we're actually refining our practices to get better. And so that's where those next two bullets come in, instructional coaching. We actually uh, uh, have pulled people, uh, some of our best teachers out of the classroom to ensure that they are instructional coaches uh, within our school. Uh, and the idea is they spend days and sometimes weeks in people's classrooms teaching them how to do this, modeling this, because quite frankly, the only way that you get some people to buy in is for them to see not only does it work in this school, it literally will work with my kids. And so if you bring your best teacher in and they can sit there and do the strategy with your kids and you can't, the problem is no longer the kids, the problem is you. Uh, and so that ended a lot of discussion and really uh, ensured a lot of buy-in because teachers saw, you know, these strategies really work, the kids like it, and look at where they're moving to as opposed to where I initially thought that we could be. Um, and so uh, the next step uh, in this process, instructional coaching is still important, but what we realize is that those in the classroom have quite a bit uh, to offer, and so we've actually begun to uh, implement a peer coaching process. And what that means is we, we pay for a pool of subs who come and, uh, and, and release teachers to actually go uh, 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 observe each other and, and provide constructive feedback. Now again, it's, it's a professional development component to that, but the idea and the rationale behind this is uh, teachers have to feel like they can communicate about what they're doing uh, instructionally and that they aren't isolated, that they aren't by themselves, and that what they're doing will get them to rigor much more quickly. Uh, the last high level strategy I want to talk to you about today is our gateways. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is far more non-traditional than what I've talked about with you uh, previously, uh, but I think it's worth sharing because what, what I think part of what makes our school special is the culture of, 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 of going, being a college-going student. And when uh, almost 80% of your students will be the first in their family to go, um, then that obviously can be a difficult conversation um, because students don't necessarily know what it takes to get to college. So our gateway process is extremely important because it helps to mystify that process. Um, essentially what this is, our students do not graduate from our school uh, based on earning credits. Uh, obviously they complete their courses, that's an important part of what they do, but in addition to that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they also have to complete these six gateways, and they can complete them at their own pace, as many as one every 45 days, or they could do not even one in a year. So the idea is it, it truly is uh, at your own pace, but of course in four years you need to get them done, so you need to average about a gateway and a half a year. Uh, the rationale behind these and, uh, is because, I'm, I'm sorry, let me go through the components first. Um, they're broken up into several things, and these are things that we've really done by backwards design. We've looked at uh, what successful college students need, what our, what our graduates have said is missing within them, and so we essentially, 
essentially have developed these gateways to address a self-reflection component. Are you thinking about who you are as a learner? Are you setting goals for yourself uh, and your personal development? Uh, community involvement, and when I say community involvement, I don't just mean community service. They are required to do 100 hours of community service, but additionally, they're required to do three job shadows and two internships. The rationale behind this is because these students um, may not have the exposure to careers. I, I can tell you right now, when, when my students come in and we ask them, what do you want to be? Um, it's doctor, lawyer, CSI person. Um, it's dancer, football player, um, singer. Um, and, and so it's almost always one of those six things. How, how many of you have had similar experiences with your students? Okay, thank you. Um, and, and honestly, I used to get kind of frustrated with them, like, really, is that all you, but think about it. That's what they've seen, that's what they've been told smart people do. Smart people become doctors and lawyers. And so the idea behind these job shadows is we want to expose you to a whole other world. And some of the job shadows we send you on will be things you want to do. If you want to be a doctor, you can go see. Or you want to, go, you want to be a lawyer, you realize they do a lot of reading and writing, and you may not like those things. So it may not be a good move for you. Uh, but the idea is go, go shadow a job, uh, an accountant. You may find that an accountant is exactly where you want to be. It may sound boring, but maybe you actually fall in love with that as a career. So the, so the idea behind that is we get the kids out and involved so they can see and, more, and most importantly, so when they go to college, they've got a much better idea of what they want to major. And I think the number of, of career of the, uh, major changes is, what, seven for the average student, I think it is. Uh, and so for our students, they don't have the, the, the financial uh, ability to make those kinds of changes. They have to go with a pretty good idea of what they want to major in, or they're, if they're lose scholarship dollars if they're not engaged in class. Uh, we also work on presentation skills. They have to be able to get up in front of a group and be able to speak intelligently. They have to know those soft skills that are required to do that, and they also need to know uh, how to come across as a professional speaker. <clears throat> uh, they frequently outshine us in that respect. Uh, they also have to, have to develop uh, writing skills. You know, if, if you've read David Conley's uh, College Knowledge, the three to five page paper is, is an extremely important component of college readiness, and we drill that into our students. You've got to know how to do it. You've got to know how to do it quickly. You've got to know how to do it effectively. Uh, and, of course, there uh, we also assess college readiness skills. It's not an option to, go, to not go to college at our school. And since that's the truth, we're going to require that you take the ACT. We're going to require that you uh, do ACT prep. Those things are built into our system because the bottom line is you're going to college. You do everything that is required to go to college. Uh, once the student has done everything they need to do for a gateway, they actually will compile their evidence and they will present this to a panel of teachers. The rationale behind that, again, is you need to be able to not just passively move through this process, but you need to prove to us that you have learned, that you have progressed, and that you're ready to move forward. And so that the student becomes really much more of the driver of their own education because they're looking at it and saying, look at what I've done, I'm ready for the next step. Uh, the purpose of these gateways uh, really is because we need to uh, provide some structure and guidance behind the college going process for our students. Um, you know, you probably heard the, the, uh, the idea of the implicit or the hidden curriculum. Uh, for, our, for our students, we believe strongly that it needs to be very explicit. Everything does. Uh, we do a corporate etiquette class that goes over the soft skills that, was, that we talked about this morning. Uh, we want you to understand, okay, when you go out onto a job shadow, you don't show up in jeans. You don't use slang. You don't do this, you don't do that. You understand the fact that you are a part of a professional environment and this is who you are when you're there. You may, when you go home, cut up with your friends, but you don't do it when you're in that kind of environment. But the idea is we build those things into the gateways so that the students understand that when I, when I leave here, I have the requisite skills to be successful at the next level. I've already mentioned the, uh, the whole idea of exposing the careers and opportunities, but we also have the, the idea of networking. We want you to go around and, and shake hands, get business cards, figure out how to leverage those relationships into scholarships, into internships, because that's, that's where jobs come from. It's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know. And right now, you don't know anybody. So go find people who will invest in you so that you'll have a job later on. Um, and you'd be surprised how well it works. We had one of our students who's now a Gates Millennial Scholar, and this young man and I went to the, uh, to the uh, uh, state capitol building, and he's literally walking around shaking hands with state senators who know him on a first-name basis. One guy's pulling out his Blackberry and saying, so when do we play ball again next? And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know who these guys are. How do you? But the idea, again, is getting out there and exposing yourself because of the requirements within these gateways for our students. Um, as I mentioned to you before, it makes that, it demystifies that college-going process. Um, and, you know, the, the bottom line is, uh, you have to understand that college doesn't just happen your junior or your senior year. It starts on day one. And so, what you, so you have to begin in that ninth grade year to do these things so that you will be successful at the next level. 
uh, I want to just kind of leave you with some ongoing challenges, things that we as an institution struggle with. Um, and again, I, I'll be the first to tell you that we have not figured this out. We're constantly changing, constantly evolving because we as a school um, have a lot to learn and a lot to do. Um, you know, the first thing is for a number of our students, what we're doing is too little too late. Uh, if you're coming to us and you're reading on a second grade level, um, then we can have great intentions, but we have to be more effective and more efficient in what we do. And sometimes, our, being a little old school, we don't have the resources to bring to bear. Uh, and so that's what we've actually, uh, this, this coming school year, we're opening up an elementary school to address many of those same concerns because we know that if we can get them earlier, we can be a bit more effective in what we do. Um, uh, you know, as, as a high-stress, high high-performing uh, uh, charter school, we will have turnover, so keeping people who are new uh, informed in what we do. Um, getting the necessary resources that we need to be successful is always a challenge, especially financially. Uh, and I, I'm sure a number of you are going to face this. This is a huge issue for us can, uh, still, and that's we have the Ohio Achievement Assessment for our younger kids, we have the OGT for our older kids, and it's finding ways to mesh those two, make sure that, make sure that our curriculum uh, is able to address the needs of both, because if a kid's in an advanced class when, when, in, in a lower grade, they may do better on the ACT, but they simply don't know the material. They've never seen a box and whisker uh, plot, and they don't know how to do that on the OAA. So we have to ensure that what we do uh, meets both of those needs, and that's a, a, an ongoing concern that, that we have that we struggle with. And of course, as, as I'm sure a number of you know, just the unique complexities that come with working with a high-risk population. Um, my contact information is there. It'll obviously be included. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have uh, via email. I'm, I'm almost always better via email if you want to get a hold of me that way. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be here, and I thank you for your time.